The Joyful Friar podcast is made possible by the generous support of our friends. To support the podcast, please visit nathan-hassel.com and donate today. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm Father Nathan Castle, your host, ably assisted today by my uh, beloved friend, Toto, the canine face of God. Over at his house, he he, uh, he belongs to my lifelong friend, Father Richard. There, there's some construction going on, some renovation at his house, and it's noisy. There's a lot of people in and out. So uh, for last night and tonight, we're doing a little sleepover. So I uh, I love it when I can be with my buddy and when he can assist with a podcast. Today, we're doing part two of a trilogy on Rodolfo, the martyred farm worker. He is in uh, book three of after the Afterlife Interrupted series. His is uh, chapter 11. Last week, I told that story in a basic form. Always, with any of these stories, you can go find them in full in either the, the print, the e-reader, or the audio version of the book. But last time I told the basic story of Rodolfo that was um, that the dream was seeing some people in the back of a pickup truck singing happy birthday and what I was pretty sure was the Spanish version of it. Uh, some shots rang out um, and somebody was killed and others were hurt. Well, it turned out when we got to go into it in prayer that it was the end of a work day in a, a field. Uh, this was... Uh, migrant farm workers uh, who had already completed a hard day of work. One of their members was celebrating a birthday. Not uh, They didn't all live in the same area or they didn't sleep in the same compound. So um, Rodolfo was his name, was the, the person whose birthday it was and who was killed on his birthday. Uh, they weren't all going to be able to go home and celebrate with him. And so they were singing him happy birthday in the back of a truck before they departed for their various uh, places. They would sleep that night. Well, anyway, he was, he was shot and killed. Well, we learned that he was shot and killed as a targeted uh, crime. He, uh, this was all related to cartels. There were some, a couple of these women had been assisted across the border uh, by coyotes who were uh, part of uh, organized crime in Mexico. And the coyotes that helped them over felt that they were entitled to some of these women's wages. So it was unjust and cruel. The women complained that they worked alongside other field workers who got paid full and nobody came and took some of their, uh, their earnings, but that they always had to pay these guys that threatened them. So, Rodolfo just decided he was going to stand up to them, even though he knew they were violent people. Uh, he said there could be a bullet with my name on it, but uh, I just couldn't let this pass. He said I was as I could I could ignore injustice the same as the next person, but this time it happened right in front of me, and I knew their names. And he just decided I'm going to stand up and and uh, defend these women. Well. Uh, he said, I knew they could kill me and for a while. They didn't. But then one day they did. <laughs> it was just so simple that way. Uh, he was grateful. He said, um, I had never been shot before, but I was grateful that bullets do their job so well. He said, I suppose I could have been shot in a way where I was uh, paralyzed for life or I had some other long, complicated uh, uh, health care issues. Um uh, but he said, that didn't happen to me. The The bullet that they uh, used to kill me killed me quite efficiently. And he said, then he said, um, as I was falling to the ground, I was being lifted up. And then he asked if we knew about the carnival game Whack-A-Mole. We all had heard of it or played it. And he said, well, they whacked me, which is a verb that's sometimes used in like Godfather movies. They whack somebody in organized crime. He said, they whacked me, but I popped back up. If you go back into last week's episode or into the chapter in book three, um, when he first arrived in the normal way that I mean, 
call this normal. It's been part of my life for 27 years. When he first showed up, it, the energy that was associated with his approach was extraordinarily powerful. I thought he must be quite a big deal. But he um, he explained that that was because he was in the cloud of witnesses, that he was instantly welcomed by the martyrs from, uh, he said, centuries ago. And he said, they respected me by including them instantly, that I was one of them. So, um, well, he died violently and suddenly, as do so many people uh, whose stories we chronicle in the Afterlife Interrupted series, normally the second part of one of these trilogies is what I call compassionate response because the person that we're dealing with went through something horrific at the time of their dying and they have some sadness that um, or some suffering that we might want to respond to in a compassionate way. Pat, compassion means to suffer with. Well, today we're flipping the script because Rodolfo's script is so different from that of a lot of other people. Yes, he's entitled to compassion because he suffered for his convictions and his willingness to stand up for these oppressed women. But he, he didn't feel like he um, needed any comforting or anything. He expected that he could be killed, and he was. And so he didn't really make a big deal of that. Um, it reminded me of, uh, of a thing I've loved about being a follower of Jesus, a Christian, uh, is the fact that the day that we remember Jesus's crucifixion, Good Friday, we call it good. And I've always thought that that just took all the nerve in the world to look at the worst thing coming to the worst and and trusting that something good is still happening here, even though uh, all the evidence would suggest otherwise. On on that good on that Good Friday when Jesus was being killed. It looked like everybody in the universe was against him. And still, there was something good going on. It reminds me, do you know that kind of tired joke about a kid that gets a pile of horse dung for Christmas? Who wants that? Well, this kid in the in the little story, little joke, is so excited and elated that he's going to get a pile of horse crap. And he's asked why. And he says, well, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. Well, I just feel like that kind of, uh, call it optimism if you want, but I don't think that quite covers it. But it, it's a determined attitude that says, I know um, I'm loved and I know that good conquers evil. And it, and, I, and in my case, I know that I will live forever. So if, if death is the thing that's threatening, well, okay, I'm going to die of something. Uh, Rodolfo pretty much said that. He said, I knew, I always knew I would die of something. And I thought if my choices were to just go along and wake up every morning in this oppressive system where these women were cheated, or if I could make another decision, I just decided to make another decision. I was going to stand up for them. Well, I feel long-winded, even though this is only about the first five minutes of this podcast. But um, today I'm not looking at how can we have compassion arise in us because Rudolfo deserves our compassion. I think it's that how can we be more like a Rudolfo that um, even when the worst comes as the worst as it did for him, when how we can um, rise above it and still be people who are busy caring for others, even if what's happening to us uh, seems like it will do us in. It reminds me when I the first year that I ever went off to seminary, I did that as a layman. I went to this little tiny, well, it wasn't tiny, but it was a tiny town. It wasn't a small seminary. It was in St. Minard, Indiana. That was the name of it. It was it's near in the, in the, the south central part of that state, uh, not very far above the Ohio River, which is the um, the the border with Kentucky. Anyway, I was there, and when you're when you become a seminarian. If you have reason to, they give you one of those clerical shirts, the black shirt with a little white tab. And if you if you go out in ministry as a seminarian, you can legitimately wear that and look kind of quasi priestly. Well, one of my uh, ministry assignments was to visit a nursing home and to bring communion to anybody, any Catholics in it who wanted to receive communion. 
uh, they weren't all Catholic and they didn't all necessarily want to go to communion, but you went just um, door to door and uh, knocked and, you know, inquired as to whether the person there would welcome a visitor. And um, I just remember um, that when, when this was a nursing home, a kind of standard medical model one with a nursing station and, you know, long straight corridors with rooms on either side and, doors a few feet apart, you'd go knocking on one door and go in and you'd find somebody that was uh, really quite ill uh, and miserable and um, perhaps in pain um, and who really didn't welcome a long visit. You might be able to stay for a moment and show some sort of uh, compassion and kindness, but you had to read the circumstance and and go about your way if it didn't look like your presence was uh, adding anything positive. And then sometimes um, you begin to notice that there were there were some people that didn't have as much physical trouble as the as the next one, but that didn't necessarily people don't respond to illness uh, and disability in in the same ways. What I, what I'm trying to say is that sometimes I found that people who had very dire uh, physical circumstances would just be so grateful that you came and visited and would go out of their body kind of and say, what a nice young man you are. Tell me more about you. How are you? There'd be people that were that would have every reason that they could be bitter and exhausted and sad who would come out of themselves and care about me. I just thought, wow, um, I was young at the time. I was in my early 20s, but I just thought if, if I live to be an old man, that's the way I want to do it. I want to be somebody who continues to care about other people, even if my life is miserable. Well, the reason I'm thinking of that is because I think that's what Rodolfo did. His life was very hard. And he said, and here were these other people trying to make it even harder. But um, that didn't deter him. He just decided I was going to do what's right because I could. And he said it didn't take me heroic courage to do what was right. I just used the natural courage that we all have. Can't you just do something because it's right? What do you think, Toto? Can you do something just because it's right? Yeah, I think so. Um, well, in his uh, story, I wanted to pick up on a few things that I thought could make us better people if we were more like, um, like Rodolfo. Uh, he told us that he he was a Catholic and that he went to mass and he sometimes took part in. Um, processions that involved Our Lady Guadalupe or rosaries or something like that. But he said, you know, I didn't hang around a church. I, I worked in fields and I went to mass sometimes. And he said, when it came time to, for me to make this decision about helping these women, uh, I didn't do it because it was um, a, a holy work. I did it because it was the right thing to do. And uh, he didn't go on about believing in an afterlife um, he just woke up into one or, or fell into one or was raised up into it, probably. Um, I, Because of the work that I've done all these years, I have a very vivid sense of afterlife. And I can look forward to a lot of reunions. You know, I don't look forward to what kind of uh, infirmity and, and pain or whatever might be between here and my grave. But I I know that, uh, that after leaving this body, I will be fine and, I, and I'll be better than ever. Well, um, that really wasn't his main motivator. It wasn't that he said, you know, if they kill me, I'll survive anyway. So bring it on. That's not what he said. He just said, I couldn't stand by while these women were being maltreated. And I just felt I needed to stand between them and the men that were doing this. So that was his own way of, um, of doing things. Uh, he, he did say that when he heard stories about Jesus that you would hear at mass, but in, and they're in the gospels, he admired the fact that Jesus was a poor man who often taught in fields. Uh, so he would have been right at home in Rodolfo's life. And he said, um, in addition to the fact that he respected poor people, um, he, he treated women well. And then I like the way he did this. He said, I was Mexican and Mexican American, and I love many things about my culture. Um, uh, music and art and history and 
you know, many uh, happy things that were part of his life because of his his culture. But he said, but there was one part I never did abide, and that was the excessive machismo, the way that it was kind of culturally accepted that men could boss women around or control them in ways that were uh, not wholesome. So I like the way he could um, nuance things and both love a tradition or a culture that he came from and observe that there were parts of it that were unholy and that he didn't have to embrace. Sometimes I feel like in recent years as an American, uh, our politics has driven us to be very all or nothing in the way that political ads are put together um, or that, you know, we... Anything that our side is in favor of must be wonderful and the other side is terrible. And he he didn't buy that. And I haven't my whole life. You know, I grew up uh, in Southeast Texas as a, a Texan and as a Catholic and an American. I had, you know, I belonged to a family that I loved and that had some flaws. I felt like I was a citizen of a country that I loved and was patriotic toward, but that was also flawed. Uh, a church where the same thing was true. But that, it seemed to me, part of, of um, growing up and maturing was being able to leave things better than you found them and contribute to the whole without just um, being a complainer and just or without opting out and being on the sidelines and not being associated with some uh, some group or including your own family that was flawed. Anyway, I just like the way that, that Rodolfo could... Um, gently critique his his culture and then when push came to shove it was pushing against machismo against the the unfair domination of women that cost him his life so anyway i just thought i'd include that in this conversation i like to the way that um he could have um just gone off on cartels and how cruel they are and how awful um uh but I think he had a sense of compassion for the people even inside them. He said, you know, these men, they would steal this money from these women, but then there was somebody up the chain that was taking some of it from them because that's the way these these oppressive systems operate. They always dominate uh, and you're always in some sort of a hierarchy. In the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis calls that a lower archy, uh, that, that the dark side has a lower archy of... Uh, deeper and darker oppressors. Well, anyway, Rodolfo didn't really care very much about that. He just said, uh, these guys who did this, they were also in an oppressive system. And so it, it didn't say he prayed for them, but he didn't hate them. Uh, and, and I appreciated that. Um, he also said that it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, American or Mexican or anything else, that anybody who chooses to can be cruel if they want to. It might, you know, if you're, if you have wealth and power, you might be able to wield cruelty with, uh, with more force and more destructive power. But he just said, you know, I know that anybody can be cruel to anybody else if they choose to. And so he wasn't just uh, going on about that power imbalance. It did bother him. And I like the way he spoke up to it. He said, you know, uh, one thing that really bothered me was that the owners of these fields would make a big um, ruckus at election time about uh, closing the border and not letting illegal folk in and so on. And then he, they turn right around and hire us to do work that they couldn't get anybody else to do. He just he just looked at that and, and just thought that was, um, you know, just deeply wrong. Um but even with all the struggle that he had in his life and all the injustices that he couldn't do anything about, uh, he was just so inspiring to those of us who were involved in this little prayer crossing. Uh, the My prayer partners in this one were both women who um, were kind of teary about, or choked up at least, about uh, what a lovely person we were meeting. He was surprised that he was elevated when he hit the ground into this cloud of witnesses. And they were saying, well, we're not surprised at all. Everything about you sounds um, lovely and, uh, and, and unitive and, and admirable. 
well, he wasn't going on about himself that way, but he didn't really need a compassionate response out of us. He didn't need for us to comfort him because it sounded like from the minute that he died and hadn't even yet hit the ground, he was re he was received into loving arms. He was received into a community of love. And uh, he still had more compassion to give. He didn't need to be on the receiving end of any compassion we might able, be able to offer. Uh, he was already whole and happy. He pretty much said, I'm going to be easy for you. You're not going to have to work at helping me to cross over. He said, I'm sort of, I'm in this cloud of witnesses and I, I, I know how to make myself more firm, but it seems like my natural state right now is more like a cloud. But then he mused about clouds and said, well, the, the water in a cloud can be a vapor until it begins to condense into droplets of water that become rain. Sometimes those become ice and snow. So the same thing can be either a vapor, a liquid, or a solid. And he said, I'm sort of like that. I'm right now, I'm mostly, um, I'm mostly a cloud, but I, I'm learning how to do other things too, how to be other ways. So it was interesting to to just hear somebody relatively new to the afterlife talk about it in that way. He often said he also said that the Holy Spirit is a wind that blows where it wills, and the Spirit of God blows where it will. And right now, the wind of the Spirit is blowing him and the others around like a cloud, and it's going to blow us to a better place. So you don't really need to coach us into picking somebody to come for me or anything. I'm already. Uh, among people who will see that I get where I need to go and that the wind of the Spirit of God is going to blow me into the next place. Well, this might be a little shorter than some of the episodes that I've done uh, in Compassionate Response, but I think that's the gist of what I had to say today. So may as well um, stop there. Uh, remember that uh, if, if these uh, stories that I tell raise questions in your mind that you'd like to have me respond to, you can always email me through my website. Uh, it's, the email is info at nathan-castle.com. I do ask that uh, if you are, uh, you've not read any of these stories in full, that you please lead it, read at least one of the books or listen to them to get a sense of uh, how my prayer partners and I go about our work so uh, I might be that way we might have a better conversation or better exchange uh, than we would if uh, you just kind of fire off an email. Remember, too, that uh, that I pray regularly for the audience of this podcast, any of you who see or listen to uh, to this. Uh, and when I do, I think in my imagination about um, air and water, breath, um, how how um, how air can find its way in through a crack, how water can find its way in through a crack. And if there happen to be places uh, in your body, mind, and spirit that you kind of sealed off because of some suffering, that the Holy Spirit might be able to find a bit of a crack where grace can move in. One of the things that I didn't mention is that uh, I'll probably go into this more next time in the spiritual extra practices, uh, third part of this trilogy, that in our Catholic understanding of things, we might have natural courage like Rodolfo did, but we don't have to rely only on our nature. We can go to our creator, whose nature is, is far superior to our own, and say, would you bless my natural gifts of courage and make them super abundant and super enduring? Because I feel like the task that's before me uh, might be larger than my own strength can handle. So anyway, that'll be for next time. But for right now, thank you for being with me and with my friend Toto. Uh, this has been the second part of a trilogy on Rudolfo, the martyred farm worker, compassionate response. So God bless you and have a great day. Bye. -bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Joyful Friar. Please like, follow, and subscribe. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. God bless.